Captain, the Borg ship is closing. Arm the photon torpedoes. Torpedoes armed. Fire the photons. The Starship Enterprise is equipped with a 24th century arsenal of armaments to defend against an army of unsavory belligerents. Phasers locked. Fire! The term phaser seems vaguely familiar, like much of Star Trek techno speak. It sounds like an advanced laser of some sort, a powerful laser with a really big wallop. But what kind of energy are we talking about? Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory is the home of NOVA, the world's highest peak-powered laser. When it fires, it puts out a peak energy that's on the order of a thousand times all the generating capacity of the United States dead shorted together at once. Now, it's for only a small fraction of a second, but an enormous amount of energy. Making a big laser is one thing. Making a tactical weapon is something else. Science fact or science fiction? We are now capable of building in fairly small packages, and by small, I mean easily small enough to fit on a ship, or now even small enough to fit on an aircraft, high enough power lasers that we can actually put them on a target and destroy uh, missiles. But will 20th century technology be able to pack the wallop of a Star Trek personal phaser into a small handheld laser-powered weapon? Over the last four or five years, we have been developing all solid state laser systems similar to the, uh, the revolution in uh, electronics where we went from vacuum tubes to transistors. Well, lasers are going under that sort of transition. And so the uh, potential to having a high enough power laser system that you can actually hold in your hand is very real. A handheld laser weapon may be within reach, but will it have a stun setting? So phases on stun. A phaser on stun, now that's a different question. Uh, there you've got to send out some kind of beam that somehow interferes with our nervous system in such a way that it makes us unconscious, Fire. but there's no permanent damage. It'd be real nice to have something like that, but I don't see how that can be done. I wouldn't be surprised if someday we could do something like that. Getting from place to place in the 24th century is no problem with the handy transporter. In the Star Trek universe, one is disassembled, transported anywhere within a 24,000 mile radius, and reassembled right down to the last DNA strand. No problem for a special effects crew, but a scientist might have a few questions. The uh, problem of putting together, you know, complex molecules like DNA uh, is, is awesome. I always had a dreadful fear that if ever I was dematerialized, that I would never come back again whole. Engaging interlock. Buffers in sync. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no problem. Energizing. Ridge, you're up. Hi, sir. There is this issue in physics that's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which basically says that you can't simultaneously know the position and momentum of a given particle with arbitrary precision. So if you wanted to transport somebody, presumably you'd have to map out every last atom and particle and electron in their bodies. Engaging interlock. Disassemble them and then reassemble them at some remote location. Buffers in sync. According to Heisenberg, you can't quite map that out. Phase coils are... I'm sorry, I just can't do this. We've got devices in the transporter called Heisenberg compensators that take care of that, but of course, we have no idea how you would build such a thing. Number one, good luck. The complexity um, of taking a, uh, a Curtis, <laughs> you know, molecule by molecule, transporting them uh, huge distances in, in uh, no time, uh, presumably, and then reconstructing all those molecules and not getting it wrong so you come out someone else. I mean, who knows? You might come out Carl Sagan or, <laughs> or Farrah Fawcett or some linear combination, which would be even worse. Uh, you worry about mistakes. Jackson, where are the others? is 
dead. To get a little recreation on the Enterprise, the holodeck works wonders. You enter a small room in a spaceship, and you walk into a New Orleans jazz club, a Garden of Eden, or even a whole western town in the 1900s, complete with a host of extras. The concept raises questions even for cast members like Cole Meany. I, I often think is the experience on the holodeck of like, you know, going out to sort of have a picnic at a, uh, at a waterfall and sort of nice, you know, green pastures, which people do occasionally on the show. Uh, if that is actually like a real experience of getting good, clean, fresh air, uh, it's one of the things we, we don't know for sure. Computer in program. There may be a lot of questions about how the holodeck works, but they haven't stopped scientists from making it a virtual reality. We have a project under development now which is uh, designed to generate something like a holodeck. Using helmets and virtual reality, we can create something very similar to a holodeck as far as the user is concerned. Butler Hine works on the Dante project for NASA. He's part of a team that's combining virtual reality with robotics to assist in planetary exploration. What you see here when you first start up is the walking robot Dante. You see it on an empty grid. Once I start walking the robot, I'm creating information in the terrain. Once it takes a laser scan from that purple scanner, the laser scan comes in as a terrain map. This is a map of where the rover's been. It's kind of like the holodeck where you see that yellow grid. The interesting thing about virtual reality is you notice that I can zoom in, look at the winch motor, pull myself up so that I'm looking at the sensor or back away so I'm seeing the whole scene. Uh, I'm free to fly around in the scene however I want. The holodeck of the Enterprise with its yellow grid has had a surprising influence on the Dante project. Actually that, uh, that grid was not our original design. Our original design had a, uh, a black and white checkerboard kind of like a chessboard and uh, the robots would pop up on this but uh, one of the requests that we got uh, by the operators was, uh, we hate that checkerboard, that looks ugly. Uh, we want something that looks like the holodeck. So that black background with the yellow grid is designed to be similar to the holodeck that you have on the show. The crew of the Enterprise may boldly go where no one else has gone before, but sometimes they use a little caution with the help of sensor probes. Now scientists are making some bold moves in robotic sensors that are catching up with science fiction. There was a show uh, on Star Trek The Next Generation that was a, a very similar use of technology to what we're developing right here. Uh, it was a show in which Geordi puts on a suit which allows him to feel as if he's in a probe that's down in a ship that's very hazardous. I feel like I'm actually here. I mean, there in the Jeffries tube. That's very similar to the technology we're developing. We're trying to use telepresence and virtual reality to give the operator the impression that they are in the remote location with the robot, that they are the robot itself. I think this is going to work. The Dante 2 project was an ambitious step towards building a probe that would someday explore the planet Mars. All Dante had to do was climb down into a crater of an active volcano in Alaska and then climb back out again. Simple enough? Not quite. After initial success, Dante got stuck on the side of the crater. Every effort was made to free the probe by remote control, but virtual reality is not exactly the same as being there. Finally, two engineers braved the elements and scrambled down into the crater to free Dante II and bring it back. NASA's virtual reality probe may not be at Star Trek level yet, but to the scientific team, the Dante II field test was not a failure. We have lots and lots of very rigorous challenges, so doing field work on the Earth helps you to learn how to solve those challenges and, and helps you to get equipment and operating systems and robotic systems that are very mature because you've learned by doing field work in rigorous terrestrial environments how to make them work. NASA scientists and engineers still have plenty of work ahead of them to get Dante ready for Mars. 